Okay, so how is everyone today? So this is the 20th and last lecture, and we're not even doing anything new today, so that's good. We're just reviewing. Um, the final exam is in two days. So, uh, when you come to the final exam, so in the first place, of course, please be on time, and please bring a sheet of paper <coughs> with the list of quiz exercises you want to redo. So it'll look something like you know, quiz 01, 03. So maybe maybe you want to redo quiz one, question three. And then another one you want to redo is say quiz uh, 04, 02, etc. All the way down to quiz, uh, you know, whatever it, whatever it happens to be. Okay, then you're going to redo up to eight. That is to say, you can redo zero if that's your desire, uh, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight, but you can't redo more than eight redo up to eight uh, exercises. Now, the sheet of paper can contain nothing else. And so to make sure it's not understood, <laughs> To, to, to make sure it's understood, it's not that it may contain nothing else, it's that it shall contain nothing else. So in particular, it's not a cheat sheet or anything like that. It's just a little sheet of paper so that you don't have to memorize an arbitrary list of quiz questions that you want to redo. Um, so that being said, on your list, you should include more than eight possibilities because you're going to want some alternates. Because it may turn out that, you know, right at the top, one of the first questions you want to redo is, say, quiz seven, question three. That, I did the worst on that one. I want to redo that one. I've got to redo that one. And then you look at it and you realize, no, I'm not going to redo that one. No, I'm not going to be able to do that. Okay, that's fine. You hand me the one that you're not going to do, and then you can go select an alternate, which means that you need to know what could be an alternate. So you should have a list of like the top 10 or t 11 that you might want to redo, okay, in order. Okay, so any question about that sheet of paper? So the way it's gonna work is that <coughs> this, for example, that means quiz for question two. And you're going to see a tower <laughs> of slots that you can pull from. You'll see one labeled 0402. So if you want to redo quiz four question two, then you need to go to the thing. You'll see it. I, hope it, I think it'll be obvious. And you select the one that's in slot 0402. That's a redo question for quiz four, question two. You select up to, uh, you turn in up to eight of these. Okay, so there's, uh, do understand that you can, it, it's up to eight. If you turn in more than eight, I'll penalize you. 
partially so that it's not worth you trying to get away with it or something like that. The reason is because uh, there's only so much labor that can be, that I can allot to this task of grading, which is a very labor intensive thing. And if I had it my, if, if I had everything my way, then I'd allow you to redo as many of the exercises as you want, really. But it just can't be that way, because there's not enough labor. Okay, so any question about that sheet? Okay, um, so this is the review day. I asked you to um, be ready to review for today. So what would you like to review? Yes? Fifteen. Mm -hmm. That's all of them. Okay. Yeah. How many questions total are going to be on the test? So, um, I, I I think your question rather is is this. So there's going to be two parts to the exam. The mandatory part. Mandatory. Part, of the of the final exam. is eight questions over uh, WHW 67 to WHW 84. So there's going to be eight selected from those. The optional part is eight selected from the previous 15. So this, this will be called quiz 16. So what's going to happen is that these constitute 28 quiz questions uh, and then here's eight more. So your, your quiz grade, which is 70% of your grade in the course, is going to be constituted of 36 quiz questions. 28 plus 8. So numerically that works out to about 2 points per quiz question. What that means is that if you were to, for example, say, forget it, I'm not going to take the final exam. I'm not even going to show up. I'm just going to take zeros for all eight of these. In, in principle, you could do that, right? <clears throat> that, would, that would, at that point, forfeit 16 points of your course grade. That would mean that the maximum course grade you could achieve is 84 as a result. <clears throat> Supposing you got 100% on every other thing. That also means that also means that because because you are able to redo up to eight exercises, that means you're also able in the redo part able to swing your course grade up to sixteen points. Supposing you got all zeros on those eight exercises in the first place. <clears throat> and then you get all ten out of ten on them when you redo them. So there's a lot at stake. Can be a lot at stake on the final exam. You can really, you can really swing it in your favor. Can you use the best grade out of the quiz reading and the quiz? We'll, we'll, we'll use the best one. So, <clears throat> as for that, let's consider. There's it's two hours and 15 minutes. That means that you have 135 minutes to do these 16 exercises. So if you just divide, if you just divide 135 divided by 16, that means that you have 
a little more than eight and a half minutes per exercise. So I promise you that that is in fact completely reasonable because the, the redo part, the redo part, you should have those eight drilled. Like you should have been drilling them over the, <laughs> over the weekend. So for example, at this, at this point, if it, is, if it is your intention to redo quiz seven, question three, then you already should have done it like three or four times over the weekend. So that you could just, just look at it and just say, yeah, here it is, but just, just get it all out. So for the redo exercises, really, you should be able to do every single one of them, e each one of them in less than five minutes, the redo exercises. The new ones maybe take you a little, a little more time, maybe, because it's the first time you're seeing them. The redo ones, it's the third time you're seeing them, <laughs> or even the fourth time, right? Because I did, it, I did it in lecture, and then I asked you a written homework question about it, and then I asked you a quiz question about it, and now you're going to do a redo question about it. <laughs> so this is the fourth time you're seeing it. <clears throat> so supposing that's the case. Supposing you can do every redo, redo exercise in five minutes, that means you could do the redo portion in 40 minutes, and then you'd still have an hour and a half to do eight exercises, which is more than enough. Yes? Um, is the final in here, or? It's in here. It'll be just like coming to a lecture, as far as time and place. Other questions? So there's not going to be any formula sheets. <coughs> so there's a variety of formulas that you simply must know to be able to answer um, some of the questions. Like, for example, you just must know the present, future, and payoff formulas for annuities, the present value, future value, and payoff uh, value formulas. You just got to know them. And the integrating factor method, you're just going to have to know it for solving a different uh, differential equation. So any questions about other things? Let's see. Uh, tonight, I'll, I'll put all the written homework grades and all the online homework grades into the grade book so that the only thing, so, so that there's, it's all up to date with the exception of the final exam. So that should give you a clear picture about it. Yes? Uh, in the grade book, is the course participation grade No, it's the one called course percent. Participation is a weighted average of how much assignments you've attempted. It, 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 would, be, it would be your course percent if you made 100% on everything that you attempted. So many uh, if not most of you have a course participation of 100%, which means that you haven't missed anything. Some people have a course participation of like 30%, which means that if they had made 100 on everything that they attempted, then they would be making a 30 in the class. That <laughs> all that that means, I suppose, is that student has numerically excluded themselves from the possibility of passing, which I don't really understand, but you are, after all, adults. Other questions? Any other?
any questions? So, here's the stack of all the, with the exception of this final exam stuff. Here's all the keys that we did in the whole class. That's all of them. Can you believe it? These and these. That's a lot of them. The keys to those, will, uh, those written homeworks there, the videos will be made available tonight, like at 9 o'clock, I think, in a couple of hours, and so will the uh, PDFs. But all of, the, all of those are going to just be for completion because uh, I want to be able to answer questions about them today if you have any questions about them. Yes? They're similar. They're similar. So, so some of them will be so similar that all that I've done is change the numbers or the function or something, or changed it from, you know, novelty Tyrannosaurus Rex skeletons to grape flavored hammers or whatever. You know, whatever. Otherwise, quite similar. So they they will be um, definitely similar enough to where I can compare them and it, and it makes sense to me to say that yes I really could substitute this question for that one. Other questions? Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to start out with one. So while I'm while I'm going over something, please cue up in your mind, oh, I'd like for him to talk about whatever <coughs> next. Okay, so in those written homeworks there, there was a question about differentials. And uh, specifically, it was the differential question um, about ellipses. Okay, so then in differential questions, questions, uh, for example, which one was it? Quiz ones that were just graded. That's what it was. Oh yeah, that, that's what it is. Quiz. So on quiz fourteen. It was this question. Okay, it wasn't about. It was about an ellipse that expands to become a little bit bigger ellipse, and that little that little thing was there. So, so that's for example, quiz uh, fourteen, question one. Quiz 14 question 1 was that there was an ellipse and then for whatever reason it expanded into a slightly bigger ellipse. So 
so that we still have this red bit. But it expanded into a bigger ellipse, and now we have this green bit also. Well, the red bit, in that question anyway, was A. This is still A. That's still A. And the name for the, what's the name for the green bit? Not B. This is delta A. That's how much, that's how much A changed. That's how much the area of the ellipse changed. So in some exercises, you want the new area. You want the new area. And do understand that area is just a placeholder for whatever, right? We could be talking about volume or socks or whatever, okay? In some exercises, you want the new area, which means that you're, you want to estimate you want to estimate A plus delta A. That is to say, you want to know what, what, how much area is covered by red and also green the new area. In other exercises, uh, you want how much the area has changed. In that case, what are you what are you trying to estimate? Just delta A. So it's just delta A. Which is to say, this one in the picture is like saying you want to know how much red and also how much green there is. This one is saying you just want to know how much green there is. So in quiz 14, question 1, in quiz 14, question 1, what was it that we wanted? Do we want to estimate A plus delta A or delta A? So what did we want? Did we want A uh, plus delta A or just delta A? We just want delta A. Why is it that we want just delta A? How can you tell? Right. And then because I remember typing this, the area of the expansion, because I thought, well, maybe some student could, could interpret that to mean the area of the new thing now that it has expanded. I went on to say by computing the area difference of two ellipses. That doesn't seem like that could be construed in any other way. That is to say the bigger ellipse minus the smaller ellipse. I just want the gray bit. That gray bit is delta A. Okay, so is it clear that on on quiz 14, question 1, that's what was requested. So let's look at a different one where we wanted something different. So 
so here is here is another ellipse question. Okay, this one we wanted what? This was written homework 63. This one says, find the exact, in the first place it says, recall that the area of an ellipse is this. Consider an ellipse with radii, those numbers. Find the exact area of the ellipse with your calculator. Okay, that means just plug in pi times 51.2 times 25.9 into your calculator. Just plug it in. Estimate the area. Estimate the area of this ellipse. So is it clear that we want A plus delta A? Not a little border of the ellipse, but the whole area. So the reason why that's the case is because this ellipse right here, where it has radii 51.2 and 25.9. So what we're doing is we're imagining, well, what if it had area, what if, what if one of the radii was 51 and the other was 26? Then it'd be easier to deal with if we didn't have these decimal points. So then we make this little band, this little strip around it, okay, which is the differential part and compute it like that. So in this one we want A plus delta A. So is it clear which, which one is which? Sometimes you want the one and sometimes you want the other. So I bring this up because as I was grading this, <laughs> this question, quiz 14 question 1, um, Some students were not clear they, that in this exercise you want just delta A, not A plus delta A. So I have to pay close attention to, to what's being requested. So any question about that one? So what would you like to see? What would you like to have reviewed? Sorry? Annuities. Okay. Any specific thing? So I guess we could start out by writing the formulas. So there's three formulas. There's the present value. No, the first one we did was future value. So future value. Of an annuity, the formula is S is R multiplied by 1 plus i to exponent n minus 1 over i. And there are four parameters in this model. So to ask you a question about this, uh, necessarily I must have given you three and be asking you to find the other one. You can always tell uh, that you're doing a future value problem when you see some kind of key phrase like um, person wants fifty thousand dollars twenty years in the future. That is to say that you want to look at your bank account in twenty years time and you want it to read fifty thousand. So at that future time you want the value to be fifty thousand. When you when you are when you are facing an exercise like that, that's a future value exercise. The next thing we did was the present value. And 
In this case, the formula is P is equal to R multiplied by 1 minus 1 plus I to exponent negative N divided by I. The most common thing that students mess up, in my experience, is that is negative N. So a present value exercise is almost always the, the, the place that they come up is you want to buy something or sell something. It comes up, the reason why it comes up there is because the buyer and the seller are coming to an agreement that right now, at the present time, that asset is worth $47,000. And the, and the seller is saying, if you were to give me $47,000, right now, then I would hand over all title of, of the asset to you right now and we could close it all out. But that's not ever, <laughs> the questions never go like that, right? The question is always, oh, it's $47,000, but I'm going to put 7000 down so that there's 40000 outstanding on the present value and I'm willing to pay monthly a, 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 a constant monthly payment. And, and then, you know, you've got to figure out whatever the other variable is. Usually, how much do you pay per month? And then the last formula is the payoff value. What this question is, what that kind of thing is, <coughs> is um, that... This, this formula addresses the question of, well, suppose that you agreed to make, say, 300 payments, and you've currently made 170 payments, and you want to know how much would it take for me to pay it off, how much would it take for me to pay it off right now? In that case, the answer is this formula. Q is R multiplied by 1 minus uh, 1 plus I to negative N minus X over I. So one thing that might help you memorize this formula is that you can get the P formula when X is 0. That is to say, the Q formula is the same as the P formula when X is zero. Because what that's saying is that, okay, suppose that I've made zero payments. How much would it cost to pay off right now? That's the present value. Okay, so those, those are the three formulas. And then what kind of thing do you want to see? Yes. So let's do. So now that I have an understanding of what you want, okay, let's make one up. Okay. Suppose that you want to. <clears throat> uh, you want to purchase. Okay, what kind of thing do we want to purchase? A dragon. Want to purchase a dragon. Uh, for how much? How about $130,000? That's the going price for a dragon last I checked. <laughs> for 130000 and uh, suppose you suppose that you put uh, say mm, twenty thousand down. And 
and that you've agreed that you're going to make, um, you don't want monthly, you want it to be quarterly or something like that, right? Okay, you're going to make, uh, we're going to say that it's going to be financed at, I don't know, 8% uh, annual interest. compounded quarterly and uh, the question is uh, and this is going to be so how many how many years are we going to pay this off <laughs> 15 years that's standard for dragons over 15 years. So the first question is what is, now in order for this to be an ordinary annuity, uh, ordinary annuities require that the payment frequency is the same as the interest compounding frequency, which means that it would not make any sense for me to ask what is the monthly payment. That doesn't make any sense. Why does that not make any sense? Right. What do the payments need to be? Quarterly. So what is the quarterly payment? Okay, and if it had been, you know, if it had been compounded every two months, then we'd have to pay every two months, etc. Okay, what is the quarterly payment? So in the first place, which formula are we using? Present value. Why are we using the present value formula? That's part, that's a big part of it. <laughs> In the end, the reason is that you've got two parties, buyer and seller. Buyer and seller have both come to an agreement. This dragon, right now, is worth $130,000. We both agree about the value of this asset right now, at the present time. Okay, so then, for that reason, you need to use the present value formula. Okay. Present value, uh, so we'll need all those things. So P, what is the, is that something we know? Is that something we need to find? Right, so that's something that we can know right now. What is, what is the present value? So, so which one is it and why is it that? Right. So what it is is that buyer and seller have agreed that the current value of the asset is 130,000 and buyer has put down 20. So that means that the outstanding balance is 110,000. That's how much is being financed. Okay. How about R? Is that something we know or something that we find? This is what we find. Yeah, it's kind of confusing because in other money games, the interest rate is denoted with an R, a lowercase r. In this case, the uppercase r is, is usually for either for recurring payment or rent. This is what we must find. Uh, I. So what will I be? Divided by four, right? 0 0.08 and then over four. Why over four? Because it's quarterly. So it's 0 0.02. And then N. Four 
Right, because it's 15 years, but because this is done on the quarter, and there are four quarters per year, that means 60 payments. So that means that 60 sequential payments are being made at the same time as 60 sequential compoundings. Okay, so is everybody satisfied with getting these numbers out of the story? So, <clears throat> what we know is we know 110,000 is equal to R, which is what we're trying to find, multiplied by 1 minus 1.002 to exponent negative 60 divided by 0 0.002, uh, yeah, 002. That's the present value formula with all the stuff plugged in except for the R that we don't know. 1.02? Maybe. Ah, this, yeah, wait a second, what did I do here? Yeah, I, I have too many zeros here. 1.02. Thank you. Better. Now, is there any question? <laughs> How these, where these numbers came from. Okay, so then uh, that means that we could write 110 thousand is R and then I could type that into the calculator so that is thirty four point seven six zero Eight eight six six eight. So that's what that that number right there becomes. Uh, then we could divide one hundred and ten thousand by that number to solve for r. And we obtain 3164.476241. Rounded to the nearest cent, that's 48 cents. So what that means is that if you wanted to purchase this dragon at, at, on these terms, you'd have to pay about 3200 every quarter. Any question about that? So suppose, for question two, suppose for question two we were to say, uh, suppose immediately after uh, the, so we have 60 payments to make, so let's suppose that say immediately after the 37th payment you want to pay it off. How much do you owe? Now what? Now we do the payoff formula. So we're going to do the payoff formula, which is to say that one. So how about Q? Is that what we know or what we're trying to find? That's what we're trying to find. Uh, R, is that what we know or we're trying to find? We just got it, right? We just got it. It's right there. R is 3164.47641. Uh, 476241. Not that that really matters, I think. 
uh, and then I, it's still the same, 0 0.02, N, it's still the same, 60, and how about this X? It's 37. Okay, so now it's just a matter of plugging stuff in. Q is 3164.476241 multiplied by 1 minus 1 1.02 and then what's the exponent going to be? Ne negative 23. Right, so it'll be negative, and then 60 minus 37 is 23, and then over 0 0.02. Now you've got to type that monstrosity into the calculator. calculator is saying, so what did y'all get? Very good. Okay, so that's saying that Okay, suppose that you have made 37 payments. Um, you owe f about 58,000 still on the dragon. Okay, and there was a question just, just like this. Question 84, writ written homework 84 was just like this. Except instead of a dragon, it was a novelty Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton. Other questions? What else would you like to see? Is it possible, <coughs> possible, possible to be asked, to be asked for, for the rate on a future um, So by rate, you mean the interest rate? No, the monthly payment. Yes. It would, it would sound like, uh, suppose that you wanted to have $80,000 in um, 10 years' time. And suppose that, and suppose furthermore that you have access to a 6% annual interest account compounded monthly. What would your monthly payment need to be? So what that story just said, because it said because you want $80,000 in 10 years' time, that means that we're talking about a future value. Because, because everyone has agreed that the amount is 80000 and the time is 10 years from now. That's different than this story, because this story is saying that everyone has agreed that the amount is 130000 right now. And then after that, it's a matter of algebra. It's always, th there's four parameters in this model. Somehow I have to give you three of them and ask you to find the last one. Same for this one. This one is slightly more interesting because now there's five parameters. So I have to give you five, one, two, three, four. Yeah, five of them. So I have to give you four of them and then ask you for the last one, which is what I did in this story. Um, <clears throat> and you, you had, had, as you said, had just found this one. Other questions? Um, 
Yeah. Okay. Um, could you pull the like in depth thing? Okay. Anything? Anything specific? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, by indefinite integral, you mean antiderivative, or do you mean integral? Um, like Improper integral. Okay. So, to, <laughs> let, let's address that real quick. <laughs> is that, as far as terminology is concerned, th this thing, when you write this, uh, for example, uh, the integral, or the antiderivative of little f of x dx is big F plus c. Uh, what, what I say, and what ma many others say, is that this is called an antiderivative. And then this thing, when you do this, uh, integral from a to b of little f of x dx. This is called an integral. Now, what the what the book says. Okay. What the book says. The book called this an indefinite integral. And then calls this one a definite integral. And in principle, they're just words. So all that's required is for us all to agree on what they mean. So at least in that principle, it makes no difference. However, I think from the point of view of teaching, the red stuff, that is to say the stuff that I say, is far preferable. Because this, this thing, doing this, is not always necessarily connected with integrals. So it's like naming something for just one of its parts. which is not, I think it loses, loses some things. And then, and then the other problem with it <laughs> is that you were talking about something else, improper integral. So it's, it, improper integral kind of sounds like this, <laughs> but it's not. Okay, so then, uh, in, this, in this class, uh, a shape, is proper when you can draw a finite circle around it. So that's a little bit loose language, uh, but that just means that essentially every shape you've ever drawn is proper, right? So is that is that a proper shape? Sure it is, right? Because I can draw a circle around it, like this one. It fits inside of that circle. So circles are also proper because they can fit inside of a slightly bigger circle. Uh, but you could you could imagine, uh, for example, this shape, the shape that looks like, uh, say, this red function is the exponential of, say, negative x. That's going to decay, and it's going to remain positive. 
and we're going to have this little sliver of green that goes all the way that way. Okay, I had to stop drawing it somewhere because I was drawing it. Uh, but I'd like for you to observe that you can't um, draw a circle around this, a finite circle. Because no matter where, no matter how much of a circle you draw, a little bit of this always extends out even further. So this is a proper shape. At least in this reckoning, and this one is improper. Now the thing of it is, is that our integrals, remember that um, integral is intimately connected to the area of shape. But the thing of it is, is that our definition of integral requires that that shape, in the end, is proper. You can't use an integral to find the area of an improper shape. So, the way that we deal with it is as follows. I could say, okay, please compute the integral from, say, 3 to infinity of, well, I don't know, 5 over uh, 2x plus 1 squared dx. Well, let's imagine what what's being requested here. So how does 5 over 2x plus 1 look? So if we look at f of x is 5 over 2x plus 1 uh, squared, and part of it is you, you've just got to know what this function looks like. So this function will look like negative half, right, this, this function f of x has a real problem at negative half. Why does it have a real problem at negative half? Yeah, and in, at that position, 2 times negative half, that'd be negative 1 plus 1, that'd be 0. So this function looks like this. So the function looks like that. So what are what is this question asking us to do with that function? being requested. Very good. So, we're only interested from 3 to infinity, so I'll just draw the right-hand side now. in the area from 3 to infinity. So that is to say that that is the integral 3 to infinity 5 over 2x plus 1 squared dx. Now what's the problem with that? At least as stated. What's the problem with this green? It's 
It's not bounded. It's not a proper shape. So that means that, in, that we can't do our integral thing. We can't do our integral thing. Because we can only go, we can only integrate over a finite interval. So what are we going to do? Was the technique that we used, and then it was it was a two-step procedure. One of them was truncating, and then what? What was it? And then a limit. Truncate, then limit. So specifically, we're going to do something like this. We're going to take this picture, and we're going to say, OK. It says to start integrating in three, at 3. We'll do that. But then we're going to cut it off, say, right here. And now you need to get a, give a name to the place where you're cutting it off. So what's the, going to be the name? B. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, we're only going to go from 3 to B. And then why is that a virtuous thing to have done? Because now it's a proper shape. So that means that we're allowed to proceed with our, our integral. So we'll do integral from 3 to B. And what we require about b is that b is some number that's more than 3. It's to the right of 3. OK, now, that is, this is now a proper integral. The truncated version of it corresponds to a proper integral. So how can we integrate that? What do we need to do? A substitution. What substitution? Good. So we'll say u is 2x plus 1. Then du is 2dx. So du over 2 is dx. I'll go ahead and change the limits now. u evaluated at 3 is 7, and then u evaluated at b is 2b plus 1. Okay. So that would be integral from 7 to 2b plus 1 over uh, of 5 over u squared du over 2. Hey, now what? I'm sorry? OK. So 5 halves integral 7 to 2b plus 1. OK, now what? u to negative 2 d and so is this one of the antiderivatives we know? It is. So that would be 5 over 2, u to negative 1, divide by negative 1, from 7 to 2b plus 1. Now, instead of writing u to negative 1, I'll write 1 over u. And I'll spend this negative to do what? Change the order, very good. So 5 halves 
multiplied by 1 over u, and now I'm going to swap the order of evaluation, so 2b plus 1 to 7. So, that's 5 halves. <coughs> Not log, we already did it. We already did the, we already anti-differentiated u to negative 2 to become this. Right. 1 over 7 minus 1 over 2b plus 1. Now, what is the meaning of this? What is this? From 3 to b, right? That's the truncated area. That is to say, this is area. And if you could imagine wiggling this B around, that green area would wiggle too. It would get a little more, a little less. And what we're going to say now is, okay, we wanted the area from 3 to infinity. So what happens, what needs to happen to this B? It needs to go to the right, all the way to the right. So, now we're going to take the limit as b goes to infinity. So the limit as b goes to infinity, 5 halves, 1 over 7 minus 1 over 2b plus 1. Well, 5 halves is 5 halves. It's a constant. 1 over 7 is a constant. Uh, 2b plus 1, because b is going to infinity, this denominator is going to infinity. So what happens to this term? It goes to 0. So this would be 5 halves times 1 seventh minus 0, which is to say 5 over 14. Now, what is the meaning of 5 over 14? Right. So th this is this is the the question. This is this is the answer to the question. It is <coughs> when you've taken this B and pulled it all the way to the right. Now, in, in this class, this is more or less the only kind of improper shape that we deal with. But it may happen that you end up taking some other classes. Shapes can, this shape is improper because it, because it has infinite horizontal extent. But if I just take this page and I turn it like that, <laughs> then now we have a shape that's improper because it has infinite vertical extent. And you can deal with, deal with that. Uh, in other calculus contexts, but we're, we just didn't deal with it. What's, what, part of what's interesting is that, you know, you can deal with shapes that have various infinite extents, like maybe more than one of them. It extends horizontally, infinitely far, and vertically infinitely far. All, all kinds of things can go wrong.
Okay, what next? Assault problem? Uh, we haven't done one. You want to do one? So let's do a mixture problem. So um, tonight, after lecture, the key to the written homework exercise will be posted. So I'm going to do, for that, for that reason, I'm going to do one a little bit different than that one, just so that there's more than one. So you can look at the written homework one like at 9 o'clock, and we'll do this one here, with a slightly different one here now. Okay. Now, before, before we do it, um, let's, look at, let's, let, let's look at that, the written homework one, for just a minute. So that's written homework. So this is the solution to that one. And there's a video, it'll be posted tonight. But I'd like to point something out about it. And that is that the answer to part B is 13,000. Now I claim to you that you could have come up with that on your own without doing any calculus. Without doing any calculus whatsoever. Now let's think about that. What? How? That's, that's kind of a bold claim. I claim that if you, if you understand this problem, you could, have, you could have answered part B without doing any calculus whatsoever. Okay. So I have a question for you. Here's the calculator. Suppose that it's currently room temperature, say 25 degrees Celsius. It's, it's achieved the, the, the temperature of this room. And now I'd like for you to imagine a scenario where I've got a blow dryer, okay, where I'm pointing the blow dryer at it, and the, it's a really big blow dryer so that um, it's just enormous amount of air is coming out of it, and I'm just bathing this in, say, 80 degree temperature. And I've just started doing it. So when I, before I started doing it, it was 25 degrees Celsius, and now that I've started pointing the blow dryer at it, it's getting 80 degree temperature air blown all over it. What's going to be the temperature of this after a while? 80 degrees, because I'm 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 using this external force, I'm forcing it into that situation. Okay, and one of the one of, the ex one of the written homework exercises talks about more or less this situation called Newton's Law of, of Temperature Exchange, Newton's Law of Cooling. Okay, it says that, more or less, that if you, have, if you have a room that is being held at a constant temperature and you put an object in that room that has no internal heat sources, then the object is going to assume the temperature of that room. That's simply a common statement of everything that we know, right? If, 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 if you put a banana in the freezer, it's going to freeze, right? That's, that's the way it works, okay? Now, if you, put a, if you put a banana that had a radioactive thermal generator in it, 
where it ha actually had its own internal heat source, that banana in the first place is not very safe. <laughs> but it won't freeze because right, it has an internal source of heat. So now, what I'm telling you about this exercise is that the answer to part B simply must be 13,000 for the same reason about these heat considerations. Because let's consider for a moment what this exercise is saying. It's saying that two things. Uh, initially, there's a thousand liters in the tank. 30 li liters per hour are poured in and 30 liters per hour are poured out. So how much is the volume changing? Zero. It isn't changing. That means that at the beginning of the experiment it was a thousand liters and at all times during the experiment the volume is a thousand liters. So the volume is not changing. And let's look at what's being poured in. Th what's being poured in is a mixture with concentration 13 grams of salt per liter. So that means that that's how much is going to go in. So suppose you do this. You're pouring in a solution that has 13 grams per liter and you're doing it for days and days and days and days. You're pouring it in and pouring it in. It's getting all mixed up, all mixed up and then you're letting the mixture pour out. Well, what's going to be the concentration in the tank after you do this for a long, long time? It's not going to be just water. It's going to be whatever is pouring in. Right? 13, concentration, 13 grams per liter, is being poured in. It'd be just like, it would be just like me saying, suppose you've got a bathtub full of red water. And you've arranged matters so that the tap pours out blue water. And there's a mixer that's in there. And you turn on the tap and you're pouring out some volume of water at a certain rate and you're letting water flow out at the same rate so that the volume in the tub is exactly the same. So it started out red water. You're pouring in blue water and you're mixing it all up. Suppose you do this for a few days and you come back and check. What color is the water going to be? Blue. Because all the red water got all mixed up and eventually poured down the drain. There's probably, you know, where the calculus is concerned, there's a few little microns of redness still in there. Okay. But you'd see blue water. Okay. Then you could make a temperature anal analogy. Say, well, what if, what if it starts out with c cold water? And then oh, you try, you say, I'm going to take a bath. And then you put your toe in there and you realize, oh, it's too cold. So then you turn on the hot water and also open up the drain such that the, the, the volume in the tub is the same. And then you're mixing it up. Well, if you do this for a long time, the temperature of the tub is going to achieve the temperature of whatever's coming out of the tap. If you do this procedure, where you have a thousand liter experiment that's always a thousand liters and you're pouring in concentration 13 grams per liter mixing it up and pouring out the rest what is going to be the concentration after a long amount of time? It's going to be 13 grams per liter because that's what the tap is. And if the concentration is 13 grams per liter and you have a thousand liters then how many grams of salt are in there? 13,000. It simply must be this number, just from reasoning alone. No calculus required. <clears throat> this kind of question, part B, is exactly like asking. Suppose that <clears throat> you put a banana in, in, a, in a freezer that has temperature negative 10. What's going to be the temperature of the banana tomorrow? Negative 10. That's what it's going to be. Okay. So any question about this? So I say this 
I, I point this out uh, for a couple of reasons. One reason is I'd like for you to have sort of an intuitive understanding about, of what to expect from these exercises. Another matter is that, well, knowing that it must be this way, when you get to the end and you actually calculate, if you don't get that number, then you know that you made an error somewhere. So it's a way to check and say, oh, no, that couldn't be right. It would be like, if you don't get the number that you expect, it would be like putting the banana into the freezer, coming back tomorrow, and you grabbing it and it being so hot that you can barely touch it. Does it make any sense? Okay. <coughs> so suppose we're doing a salt uh, exercise. The same in the same manner as uh, the other salt ones. Uh, suppose that um, that we're going to pump in, say, uh, 30 liters per hour. Pump in 30 liters per hour with concentration. Uh, 26 26 what am I saying uh, 26 grams per liter so some fixed amount of fixed concentration is coming out it's going to be mixed and we're going to pump out say, uh, 25 liters per hour uh, of the mixture. Suppose that there is initially uh, I don't know 1300 grams of salt in 100 liters of solution. Okay, the question is, one, uh, determine the amount of salt Two, I want you to determine. Now let's think about this for a second. Now the previous question that we just looked at, written homework 78, question two was how much salt is in the, con is in the thing, in the tank, after a long amount of time? And the answer was 13,000 grams of salt. Now, how much salt will be in this container after an, after an infinite amount of time? This, this question has a slightly different character than, than the other one. Let's ask a slightly more straightforward question. How much volume will be in this container? How many, how many liters of solution will be in this container after an infinite amount of time? Uh, 
Okay, how much, how much volume is in the container when we begin? 100 liters. How much is in the container after an hour? 105. Why is there 105 liters after one hour? Right. So you've got 30 coming in and 25 going out. So that means that this is like filling up a bathtub. So that means that after one hour, there's 105 liters. After two hours, 110 liters, etc. So after an infinite amount of time, there's an infinite amount of liters in the container. Okay, so that doesn't make physical sense, uh, but that's fine. This is a math problem. So how much salt is in there then? Also an infinite amount. So the amount of salt that goes into the container over an infinite period of time is an infinite amount. So I can't ask you, it doesn't make any sense for, for me to ask, determine the amount of salt after an infinite amount of time. I'm going to ask a different question. Determine the concentration of the salt uh, after a very long time. So this, actually, you can answer right now. What is the answer to question two? Twenty-six grams per liter. That's gonna. That's the answer. It's just like it's just like saying, suppose you've got a bathtub. Like not a bathtub, but like an enormous, enormous tub, <laughs> right? huge thing. And that it's just got this cold water in it. And then you turn on the hot tap, and hot water's coming out. And you mix it all up, and you're letting some of it drain out, but it's, but it's filling up faster than it's draining out. What's going to be the temperature after this? After a long time, whatever's coming out of the tap, that's the temperature. This is saying exactly the same thing, except in terms of concentration. Suppose you've got 26 grams per liter fluid coming out and you're mixing it all up and letting some stuff drain out. What's going to be the concentration after a long amount of time? 26 grams per liter. So the answer to part two, by the time we get to part two and answer it, it's simply got to be 26. If it's not 26, then we've made an error. Okay. So again, the same kind of apparatus that we always have. We've got water pouring in, water pouring out. We've got an initial volume of water. As it happens, the volume in this exercise is increasing, so that makes it kind of interesting. We're not going to worry about the case when like this, this tub is so big, it's never going to overflow. We're not even, that's not even a thing. We're not worried about that. So as far as symbols are concerned, we need to figure out what letter is going to represent what. So how do you want to represent salt? S, that's good. You know, N is another good one for salt. Why is N another good one for salt? Yeah, what's, what's the name? What's the name of salt in Latin? Natrium. And what is, what is, the, what is the symbol on the atomic table for sodium? N-A. Which are, of course, the first two letters of natrium. Natria. Okay, whatever. We use salt. Uh, S for salt. N would be clever too. Uh, so what is the initial condition for the salt? That's to say at time zero we know the salt to be what? Uh, 
1,300 grams. Okay. <clears throat> now, just like all the other times that we've done salt exercises, what is the other variable we need to keep track of besides the quantity of salt? Yeah, the amount of solution, really. The volume. V. And what is the initial condition on the volume? That is to say, at time zero, what is the known volume? One hundred. So now we need to come up with equations. So, I hope after enough time you can kind of work through most of these details in your head, but here they go. So, this is me showing all the details in all their glory. So, what we want to do is we want to come up with uh, the rate of change of the salt content. Now, the salt content, uh, some salt is pouring in because the tap has salt in it. And some of the salt is pouring out because it's all being mixed up and then being poured out. So there's some salt in there and there's some salt leaving. So this is the rate of the salt coming in minus the rate the salt going out. It's, it's simply got to be this way. Okay, let's see if we can put a finer uh, idea on that. So now we need to get it in terms of concentration. So this is going to be the rate of the volume going in multiplied by the concentration coming in. Okay, that's, that's how much salt is coming in. And then minus, minus what? Right, the rate of the volume going out, <clears throat> and then times what? <clears throat> it's got to be the concentration going out. Now let's, let's, um, let's see why it simply must be this way. So this is ds dt. So it doesn't really matter for our class because it's not something that we really keep track of. But let's think about what should be the units of ds dt. So the units of s are grams. Because that's, because that's how much salt we're talking about. And the units of t, because of the way we're measuring it, is hours. So really this should be, what should be the units for this? should be grams per hour. This should have units grams per hour. Let's see if that works out. Well, what is the rate of the volume coming in? So how much volume is coming in? Thirty liters per hour. And then what is the concentration coming in? Twenty six grams per liter. And let's look at the units for a moment before I copy the rest of that. Observe, 
that we have leaders in the numerator and leaders in the denominator. So after canceling the leaders, what's left? Grams per hour. So do you see? Ah, even the units testify to this being the right thing. Okay. Minus. What's the rate of the volume going out? Right. 25 liters per hour. And then now, what's the concentration going out? This is the tricky part that some students have difficulty with. That is to say, right, right here in this, these parentheses, that's where I want to put the concentration going out. What goes in those parentheses? What is it? Not B. S over V. The amount of salt divided by the volume of the solution. That's the concentration. And this, this the, con the units of that is in grams per hour. Uh, so, sorry, grams per liter because it's S grams and V liters. So ignoring all of the, dispensing with all the units business, just ignoring them, this is saying 780, because that's 30 times 26, and then minus 25 over V, S. So that's the differential equation that must be solved. Is there any question how we arrived at that being the differential equation that we need to solve? Okay. Now, um, T is time. It's the independent variable. It's the variable that goes on without regard to anything else. Okay, what are the dependent variables? Well, S and V, right? The thing is, is that notice that S changes with time. The amount of salt changes with time. Also note that the amount of volume changes with time. Okay, so both of those change with time. So we need, in order to solve this equation, we must first eliminate V. So currently V, v is in that equation and it can't be there and, and we can't proceed until it's gone. Okay, which means that it's sort of like, okay, that's on pause for a minute. So now we have a new equation that we need to deal with, dV dt, because the volume changes in time. What's going to be the formula for, for dV dt? Remember, it's just like the, it's just like the salt. DSTT is the rate of the salt in minus the rate of the salt out. Some salt is coming in, some salt is going out. DVDT, well, this is the rate of the volume coming in minus the rate of the volume coming out. Well, how much volume is coming in? Thirty. 
30 liters per hour, as you say. And then how much is going out? 25. So that means that dBdt is 5. Now, does that make sense, that dBdt is 5? It does, right? That's what the story says. It says that it says that 30 are coming in, 5 are going out. So that means that the, the slope, the rate of change of the volume is 5. Okay, so how do we solve for V? Integrate, anti-differentiate. So V is the antiderivative of 5 dt. So V is what? 5t plus some unknown constant. How do we figure out the unknown constant? Yeah, plugging in the, the known condition on the volume is that at time zero, the volume is 100. So we should have 100 is <coughs> zero plus C1 using this data. So C1 is 100. So we've established that the volume is 5t plus 100. OK. Now, does that make sense in terms of the story, that the volume is 5t plus 100? Why does that make sense? What's it saying? Mm -hmm. So, for example, at one hour, there's 105 liters. At 10 hours, there's 150 liters. OK, so now, now, we're going to take this. And we're going to substitute it in to that V. I'm going to put it in there. So we've established that DSDT is 780 minus 25 over V, but we established that V is 5T plus 100, uh, and then S. So now have a look at this equation. <coughs> now how many? variables depend on t. Just s, right? v's gone. So that means that now we can use the stuff that we know. So how do we solve this? Can we do it? We can't separate them. I can't, I, at least I, I can't see how to separate them. Because, you know, you'd want this S to be over here with the DS. So to, to achieve that, uh, you'd need to divide by S. But then you'd be dividing that thing by S. And then it, then it wouldn't work. So you know two techniques for solving differential equations. One of them is separation. What's the other one? Integrating factor. 
That's what we must use. We'll use an integrating factor. So in order to do that, we need to put this into standard form, put the equation into standard form. The standard form is ds dt plus p of t s is equal to q of t. So, if we want to get it in this form, what do we need to do to this? How do we need to manipulate this equation? Yeah, this term that has the S, it's going to have to be moved to the other side. Oh my goodness. So taking this equation, ds dt, moving that term to the other side, twenty five over five t plus 100 is equal to 780. So as, uh, no, I, I missed something, <laughs> the important thing. S is equal to 780. So what's what here? What's, what's P and what's Q? Use this bit. Okay, and what's P? Yes. They want to see how they get picked out. That means that's P of T. What's the formula for the integrating factor? So I of T <coughs> is what? This is, some, this is one of the things, the formula is one of the things you must memorize. Yes, it's the exponential of the antiderivative of P of T dt. That's, that's a formula that you simply must memorize. Okay. So, doing that, I'm going to extract that out and just do this part first. The antiderivative of P of T dt, that's the antiderivative of 25 over 5t plus 100 dt. Okay, how do we do that? Can we do that?
Okay, what? Okay, so if u is 5t plus 100, then du is what? Not 5. So I, I think I know what you meant, but this, this equation doesn't make any sense. 5 dt. It's okay, I was kind of putting you on the spot there. So du is 5 dt. So du over 5 is dt. Okay. So that means that this would be antiderivative of 25 over u and then du over 5. So now the 25 over 5 can be factored out. And it, would, it, would, it factors out as a 5. So do we know the antiderivative of 1 over u du? <coughs> yeah. This would be 5 and then log absolute value of u. Now, I'm leaving something off and I want someone to say it. Plus c. I'm not going to do it. Why not? So right here, at this position, there's no plus c because, because why? Well, earlier, 100c is 1 equal to 100. Does that have anything to do? It's not that. Okay. So formerly, on the previous page, we, we did an antiderivative. And we needed a c, we needed a, a c1 here because we were trying to figure out the volume function. We got that figured out. We did need the, the constant there. What are we trying to do right here? Well, yes, but we're sort of in the midst of, of a procedure right here. What are we doing? What are we constructing right now? We're in the middle of a, of a recipe to make this thing, right? What's its name? Its name is the integrating factor, right? And if you recall, when we talked about what the integrating factor is, once you find it, once you find it, you take your differential equation and multiply both sides of your differential equation by this integrating factor. So what if, what if we took the constant to be 7, the constant of integration to be 7? Well, we'd be multiplying both sides of the equation by this 7 so that we could just cancel it out. What if we took the constant of integration to be 100? Then we'd be multiplying both sides of the equation by this 100, and then we'd cancel it out. So when you're making the integrating factor, you don't use the constant of integration. So there's no plus c because we're making the integration factor as part of this procedure, as part of the recipe, if you like. Because we're in the midst of making the integration factor, we don't need the constant of integration. So then this would be 5 natural log. And then now I can substitute u back, absolute value of 5t plus 100. 
but what else can I do now? I can simplify this even further. How can I make it more simple? Uh, yes, that's true. I'm going to do that in a minute, though. Uh, that is to say, bring the 5 in as an exponent. I am going to do that, but I want to do something else first. I'm not sure what you mean by that. The, there is no log rule when the plus is inside. When the plus is inside. There's, lo there's a rule when the plus is outside. How can we get rid of the absolute value? Yeah, right? Let's consider. There's some specific time where we start the experiment, and that time we're calling zero. So that, and there's no, as far as the experiment is concerned, there's nothing that happened before it. We're never measuring negative time. It's from zero on. So do you observe that 5t plus 100 is a strictly positive quantity? It's never going to be negative in our experiment. <coughs> so we can drop the absolute value. So as a result, the antiderivative of p of t dt is 5 times the natural log of 5t plus 100. And therefore, the integrating factor that we were looking for, i of t, is the exponential of that thing we just found. So it's the exponential of 5 times the natural logarithm of 5t plus 100. So now what do we need to do? <laughs> This can be simplified further now. So now we need your suggestion. Is that this 5 can now come in side of the log. <coughs> the 5 can go into the log like this. So exponential of the logarithm of 5t plus 100. And now the 5, let's color it. This red 5 here went inside the log to be this red 5. using a log rule from college algebra. Now what can we do? Right, now the exponential and the logarithm cancel, and we're left with 5t plus 100 to exponent 5. So that is the integrating factor that we were looking for. <coughs> So, so notice that we haven't solved the differential equation. All that we've, all that we've done is we did this, this sub-step in a multi-step procedure. Now, once, that you've found the, once you've found the integrating factor, the very next step is always that the time derivative of the integrating factor times s is the integrating factor times q. Okay, so this is the next step. So now, from here, we want to solve for s. So how do we solve for s from here? Uh, 
I don't know. I, what? I'm not sure I follow you. We need to solve for s. Right? Which means that we need to get the derivative to the other side. So on the, on the left-hand side of this equation, this, is, this d dt is derivative. When you, get it, when you move it to the other side, what is it? Let me ask it like this. Suppose, suppose I was covering up uh, a 10. If I was covering up a 10 there. What would you have to do to solve for s? You'd have to divide by 10, right? What if I was covering up a log? Then we'd have to get the log on the other side, and what is it on the other side? Exponential, right? I'm covering up derivative. What is it on the other side? Okay, you could, you could view it like that, but I'm going to do it in a slightly different way. And, it, and that is what you just said is, is what I've said on numerous occasions. So now what I want you to observe is that to give it, to color code it, this is DDT, and this green DDT is going to move to the other side. And when it moves to the other side, When it moves to the other side, it looks like this. D this, this DDT on the left-hand side is this antiderivative with respect to T on the right-hand side. So that's how it moves side to side. OK. So that's saying that 5T plus 100 to exponent 5 S is antiderivative <coughs> 5t plus 100 to exponent 5 and then q was 780 dt. <sighs> this is <coughs> at this point I'd like to remind you <coughs> that um, there are course evaluations of it currently. <clears throat> that, it, that is to say, um, you're supposed to numerically rate how I've done in the course and how the course was and um, leave comments and all that kind of thing. So please do that um, if you have a mind to do that. Uh, but the reason why I'm suddenly reminded of this is that one, one of the comments that I always get in my course evaluations is that he never does any difficult problems in class. <laughs> Part of that, really this question is not actually that difficult, it's just so long-winded. That's a big part of it. The other thing is that it just doesn't look difficult when someone is well-versed and they're doing it. Like, when I watch people juggle who know how to juggle, if I watch them long enough, I think, I can juggle. <laughs> and, and then, you know, I try and grab a few things and then, no, in fact, I can't juggle. <laughs> that's, that's the truth, actually. <laughs> I just, but I'm sure that I could if I practiced, but I just don't. <laughs> okay, so how do, we, <clears throat> how do we do this from here? What do we need to do? Another substitution. Okay, so how about W, since we already used U? W is what? 5T plus 100. <coughs> then DW over 5 is what? DT. So making that substitution, this would be antiderivative of w to 5 
times 780 times dw over 5. So now, the 780 over 5, that's just some, something that we can factor out. Do we know the antiderivative of w to 5 dw? w to 6 dw, right? <coughs> so uh, 780 over 5 is 156, so that'd be 156 w to 6 over 6. And now, do we need a constant here? Do we need an, uh, an anti-differentiation constant here? I'm asking because when we were making the integration factor, we apparently didn't need one. So now, now maybe nev we never need one. So do we need one? Yes. Because the reason why we need one, it, it's, it's not, the question is not really why do we need one. The real question is why did we not need one? <laughs> The reason why we did not need one in the integration factor has, is everything to do with just the way that procedure works. Okay? It's a strange circumstance when you don't need one. Here you need one. This one eventually is going to, is going to help us use the initial data for the amount of salt. Right? We still haven't used that data. Okay, so 156 <coughs> divided by 6 is 26. So that's 26, and then w to 6, but w was that. So 5t plus 100 to exponent 6 plus c2. <coughs> so now we have this is equal to that, and we want to solve for s. So we need to divide by 5t plus 100 to exponent 5. Okay. <coughs> so that would be 26 times 5t plus 100 to exponent 6 plus c2 divided by 5t plus 100 to exponent 5. Yeah? Because this is equal to that, and we want to solve for S. And now we want to use um, the initial data. But before we do that, I'm going to simplify this a little bit. I'm going to divide the denominator into the numerator. So. If, this, if that first term were divided by 5t plus 100 to exponent 5, then it would be 26 multiplied by 5t plus 100, because there'd be just one of them left over, and then plus c2 divided by 5t plus 100 to exponent 5. Okay, so now we need to figure out C2. How do we figure out C2? How do we figure out C1?
<laughs> the volume that so when we were trying to figure out C1 that was the initial volume so now we're trying to figure out C2 that's the initial quantity of salt yeah so now we're going to use the TS equal to zero and then what was it 1300 is known to is known to be part of the solution so that means that 1300 is equal to 26 and then times 100 and then plus C2 divide by 100 to exponent 5. So using that we can solve for C2. So that's 2600, 1300 minus 2600 is negative. 1300 equal to C2 over 100 to exponent 5 so this would be negative 1300 times 100 to 5 that's C2. So now we figured out <laughs> the equation for the salt. So the amount of salt is 26 times 5t plus 100 and then plus negative 1300 times 100 to exponent 5 divide by 5t plus 100 to exponent 5. Incredible. That's how much salt there is <laughs> in the container at any time. So I could ask you how much salt is there in four hours? Well you could you could come to the right answer by plugging in t is 4. That's the answer to part one. <laughs> What's the answer to part two? <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta look back, flip back a couple pages to figure out, well, what was question two? <laughs> the question was, is determine the concentration of the salt after a very long time. And I, I, foreshadowed for you that you should know the answer to that question before you get there. What is going to be the concentration? Well, you look at the beginning of the exercise. It says that we're pumping in 30 liters per hour of 26 grams per liter salt. So that's the force. That's like saying Okay, you're pumping in blue water. <laughs> What's it going to look like after a little bit of time? Uh, it's going to look like blue. You're pumping in 26 grams per liter concentration fluids. What's it going to look like after a while? That's going to look like that. So that means that the limit's simply got to be 26. So I have a question. Is this what I'm asking for you to do? Am I asking for you to compute the limit as t goes to infinity of s. Is that what I'm requesting? So that's, that's the language. Is that what I'm asking? This, this is what I was asking on the written homework exercise. In the written homework exercise, it was tell me how much salt there is in the container after a long amount of time. That's not what I'm asking. What am I asking? Determine the concentration of the salt. 
So it's not this. This, this is the amount, not the concentration. So, so this would be wrong. Rather, what, 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 am I, what do I need you to do? I do need you to compute the limit as t goes to infinity, but of what? Not s. Not v either. That'd be the volume. So it's not s. It's not v. But it does have an s and it does have a v. It'd be S over V, the amount of salt per volume. That's concentration. That's concentration. So this would be, we've got to hurry this up because we're running out of time here. Copy that crazy expression there. 26 times 5T plus 100 plus negative 1,300 times 100 to 5, divide by 5t plus 100 to exponent 5. That's s. And then all of that over v, which from a couple pages ago, you could look and see is 5t plus 100. So now I'm going to divide the denominator into the numerator. So if I divide the denominator into just that term, what would be left if I perform that division? Just a 26. And then plus. Now if I divide 5t plus 100 into just that term, we'd have negative 1,300 times 100 to exponent 5 and then over 5t plus 100 to exponent 6. So now have a look. That's a 26. So its limit is itself. What's the limit of this term? It's 0, right? Because this numerator is a really big negative number. But this denominator, its limit is infinity. So, so constant divided by infinity, that's 0. So do you see that this is completely expected? It must be this way. This is just like saying, if I do the bathtub thing with blue water, eventually the water in the bathtub is going to be blue. Or if I put the banana in the freezer, eventually the banana We'll be frozen. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> okay. So we're out of time. So email me if you have any questions.